us through. So, uh, so yeah, the, uh, the document is core task for facilitating healthy transitions. Um, and I, I see this as a bit like a checklist and, a, and an index page. Um, oh, thanks. Okay. Sorry, right. everyone else. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. So. <laughs> 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 okay, so um, first step, um, helping the, the uh, senior pastor to actually um, say goodbye Farewell the church intelligently, well, uh, and thoughtfully. Um, so out of that, um, a number of years ago, I wrote a little document called Leaving Well. So if you can find that on your page, this is the time to, um, to quickly uh, look at that. It's about a three-page um, uh, document. Has everybody got a copy? Um, okay, so um, just to, to keep things ticking over, what I'd like you to do is just in pairs... Um, Quickly fly down through that document. Take a few minutes. I'd like you to highlight three things out of the document that you think these are really important things to do. So this is written for a pastor who's leaving a church. He's got some recommendations for things to do. So um, uh, you're okay just to very quickly fly through it. One of my little rules as a consultant is never give out to somebody a resource that you haven't worked through yourself. <laughs> so ju just... <laughs> Otherwise, you don't know what this is, what it really contains. So here's your chance. Uh, we'll just take 15 minutes, give you a chance to read it through, circle some stuff, uh, pick up some bits and pieces. Um, you've got a copy of this as a PDF file. Um, if you think it needs some changes, talk to me about it. I'm quite happy to adjust it. Um, but this is a document you may well find you give out to people. I give it out regularly um, to other people. Uh, so it'll be yours to be able to give away. Um, or use yourself. Um, just pick out a couple of highlights to come back and, and uh, share in about 15 minutes. So if you need a, a quiet chair or a place to think, or you need to go and get a coffee, now's the time, um, to uh, quickly work you through. A couple of highlights and then we'll pick up a quick whip around the room in about 15 minutes, just so you know and understand this particular document. Leaving well. Leaving well. So is, is everything here PDF as well? Yes. Yep. yep. So you can scribble all over it. You can scribble all over it. Please do. Please interact with it um, and, uh, and just reflect because um, so this is something to give to a pastor on the recommendation that they um, do some things here with it. Okay, how are we all going? Everybody pretty well close to finishing? Right, just, um, we'll, we'll just step around, pick out one or two, three, maybe um, just key points that you'd just want to highlight. Um, in here, how do people leave a situation well? Um, what are the important things to keep in mind and, and, uh, and consider? So, we have to go this way. Um, I think the thing that struck me is the, uh, maybe the hard way to begin with, yeah. to leave well, and perhaps take more effort, yeah. but uh, it's a bit of a yeah. tough. Yeah. Um, a lot of people naturally think, just do it quick and, and, and easy. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just make it simple, I'll make it fast, I'll make it painless. But in actual fact, that often causes much deeper pain for others and for yourself. Um, so it's worth the time and the effort. Very seriously is. Um, I think that one of the uh, not so happy ones that I uh, was a part of, well not directly, but um, certainly um, heard about this happening from many friends. Um, the pastor who just stood up without any warning to anyone um, in the Sunday service and said, right, that's it, I quit, I'm finished, all over, stuff this for a joke. And <laughs> tell us what you really think. And walked. And walked down. And walked down the. Walked down the aisle and finished. Left, left the chair. Um, so it has the benefit of being absolutely clear. But <laughs> so you're recommending that. Possibly the disadvantage of. Um, uh, you know, leaving a lot of stuff <laughs> resolved, quite obviously, yeah, and not very helpful for himself or um, for the church. So, yeah, just um, the choice to, you know, even if it's difficult circumstances, but to conclude well is well worth it. Well worth it. Yeah. So we'll, we'll keep going around. Any, any other? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> um, just a reminder, having finished. 
for a long mm. history at Bisco, not that long, it's years ago now. So yeah. Mm. Just a reminder, yeah, it does take time. It yeah. take time to get over. Yes. But it's interesting, it's a hard yeah. thing to do and important to. Yeah. Um, yeah, we took time to visit every person, at least particularly those who are significant. Yes. Uh, in and outside the church, mm. to say goodbye personally. Yep. And while it was really hard, it was really worthwhile. To, to go. Nice Um, I, I was, my wife and I were actually on the receiving end of that just about two or three weeks ago, where um, a person leaving ministry in Tasmania, who we'd had some challenges and difficulties with, um, actually took this to heart, came to visit us and apologised about some things. Um, and it was a very special moment. Um, and, and they were doing that because they were moving somewhere new and they needed to sort stuff out from the past. And that was really, really quite special. Yeah, but it is hard. Totally, totally agree. Yeah. Hello. So just get the idea of quick and clean, not hurting people is completely wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I do wonder if Ian's used that saying that I know many pastors have used it. It's like two, two pastors in a row. What are they <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. A bit disingenuous. <laughs> <laughs> How does one end? Well, there seems to be a template. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's worse when they don't change the take out the brackets. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Can't know do name and end. Yeah. <laughs> no, good, good call. I think the general idea is to take a, take an idea from this and extend it out to be a bit more personal. But uh, yeah. Oh, I didn't use that when I finished. But, um, I probably should have. I, I like the affirm in important relationships, but for me it was helpful to, um, because I was staying in the church, to redefine expectations yeah. within relationships. Yeah. And that's hard. Yes. And it has been hard. Yeah. 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 yeah that I was going to say that interesting reflection that's probably worthy of more thought is, as someone may be leaving, not necessarily staying, but what the ongoing relationship is. Yes. They talked about weddings and funerals and things yeah. like that. Yeah. I guess it depends what role you're going into and how far yeah. away, but it's probably worth a bit more exploration. Yeah. 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 Uh, for me, it was about 15 years ago since I did this, so it's yeah. been a while. Mm. Um, but I did the, you made a few people notice, the, the term there is the Friday week. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll probably get a different name for that. Yes. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I did that and people found that helpful rather yeah. than really keeping people in mind. to keep working. Mm. Uh, it's really easy to get excited about the future yeah. um, and start to drop off. It says complete tasks and tidy up loose ends. Mm. And they may be relational, they may be, yeah. if you've ever seen my desk, it would yeah. take now until I leave in 10 years time to do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, keep working, finish things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I noticed similar to the idea about how to be lovely to resolve where your conflict is mm-hmm. where you're going. A bit about if the move is about conflict, it's probably, and you're going there, you probably won't resolve at all, or it'll yeah. be difficult. However, the relationships still need to be affirmed, and careful goodbyes need to be said. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. Yes. <laughs> yep. But I, probably, I think I stand by it. It's, um, um, I'm, I'm agreeing with it, I think it's a good yeah. sentence, but it's yeah. a thought for yeah, and, and it's very hard if there's been a major conflict to have a, a still have an appropriate farewell that, that doesn't is not a farce in in that sense. It's the notion that there's something to affirm in those relationships yeah. still. Yeah. So that can be verbalised mm. through goodbyes as well. Yeah. Because it's without them being false. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Point. Yeah, good. It says here 
clarify the future relationship of the church with the living pastor. Mm. You know, like when I took over the Arabic church and the living pastor was the founder, and yes. it's impossible just to, yeah. you know, to ignore him or put mm. any limits for his relationship with the church and myself. And, you know, from my own experience, like I was preaching one Sunday, he's preaching one Sunday. Yeah. And after that, we cut it down and preach two Sundays and in one Sunday yeah. and three Sundays. And, you know, like yes. step by step, step otherwise yes. it will never work. work. Yeah. Like mm. for us, like if you stop him by putting AVO on him. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Understand the. And understand the cultural nuances of some of those issues. Yeah. Um, We're still good friends. He's uh, 94 now. Oh, that's good. So along similar lines, the importance of a public farewell. Yeah. I'm aware of a church where the outgoing pastor was leaving on good terms. Yes. Um, at his last um, leadership meeting, yeah. um, he introduced the new chairperson to close that meeting yeah. As a symbolic handover. Yeah. At his last communion service, yes. um, he led the first part of communion. Yeah. And then the, uh, one of the, the key leaders yes. came and led the remainder of yeah. the communion. So it was all very visual yes. and, and symbolic. symbolic. Yes. It was a definite handover. handover. On. Yeah. Uh, he went and joined the congregation then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 great. Mm. I don't like this, mate. You don't? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking back to the couple of times I did it and going, really? <laughs> that was you, wasn't it? Well, it doesn't surprise me I probably didn't communicate well enough with enough of the key leaders. I did it with some, but yeah. not broadly enough. And also I had in my mind that a month was about the right time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just gave a month's notice and left, but you're saying three months. Three months, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that was also the, uh, the era, because I think back of leading the first church mm. five years ago. Yeah. And, um, you know, you tell your key friends that yeah. afternoon and that night, you declare your, uh, that you're yeah. moving on, yeah. and some really close friendships took years yes. to yeah. recover, and some never did. Yeah, yeah. You know, that sense of betrayal and whatever, yeah. and yet I'm confident we were told, you know, short and sweet, two yeah. weeks. Yeah. But yeah. it's nuts. No, exactly. Still haven't left off next church. Yes. <laughs> That's right. yeah. I, I moved here from the UK where the standard uh, contract between a pastor and a church includes a three month notice period. Yes. Um, so that was that was just the accepted norm. No, yeah. You could announce your resignation, but you had three months. Yes. Still there. Yeah. We had three months notice in the constitution. Yeah. Yeah, but two of those are holidays that it's <laughs> in effect yeah. the same, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. true. It's after lunch, everyone's had coffee, it's all good. Um, uh, well, I suppose my reading of this and, and listening to the banter or something, is there anything written for wives? That's a good question. Uh, or husbands? Yeah, it's a really uh, great children. question. Yeah. And, uh, my son, I have two sons, yeah. my eldest has autism, and leaving for him yeah. mm -hmm. is ripping. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. It's yeah. Absolutely ripping. Yeah. Uh, experience, but also the one for, for my wife who's yes. a teacher who yeah. loses her job yes. every time she moves right. and this kind of stuff. Yep. Is there stuff written to help for wives right. and the kids? I'm, I'm not aware of specific things for wives and family, but yet that's a really significant and important point. Um, because for many spouses, it's a major, it's a major shift. Um, and in ministry, and particularly for teenage kids, they lose not just, um, you know, it's not just like a, 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 an average move, that you lose sometimes your whole um, youth group, your um, school, your family environment. There's, there's huge losses that take place. And they've had no power yeah. or wealth, so, depending on the yeah. family or whatever. Yeah. But in essence, yeah. it's not their decision. No, that's right. Mm. That may be the reason some pastors don't go when they should. Yes. Because yeah. their family's so invested in the situation. Yes. That's very difficult to do that. 
Yeah. I have to deal with my wife. She gets to pick when we retire. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's had to follow me so many times, so it's only fair. Yes. Yeah. Good. Are you familiar with um, much of the stuff that's coming out of the US at the moment, particularly from a large church church where they're talking about succession planning? Yes, I'm watching that. Yeah, there's a, a really interesting move where yeah. they're saying, oh no, that the incumbent pastor and leadership team are actually involved in the succession planning. It's really kind of a, a baton change. Well, they're like Craig's doing that at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, I've already announced who's in the new post when the pastors are. Yeah. Um, what is happening at a few places now? What are people commenting? Yeah. Um, look, I think in certain places that are quite unique, like Willow Creek's a unique situation, there, there is some value in, in people thinking very carefully and thoughtfully about that. The, the danger is you don't, is, and I think most senior pastors that are pastors of those larger churches are well aware that. Um, their role in the life of a church is unlikely to be able to be replicated in another person. And so we, the, we, there's a need then for some form of rejigging the system um, around that. Because certainly some of the bigger churches are, they, they, they've built themselves, so someone like Willow Creek has built itself around the Bill Hybels as a person. Yep. And um, you're never going to replace that. Um, and so it's going, to, it's going to be, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be different. You know, now it may, be, it may be just as you know as successful, but it's going to be a different thing. And and for the whole team to learn how that's going to work, I think is a really significant um, transition. Yeah. Um, well, like, when I was younger, before I was a minister, um, I, my, my going to Yeovil was actually announced the day that the previous guy retired. Yeah. Um, and he had been somewhat part of that, not in the selecting me although it looks like it because we're brought up on neighbouring farms. Um, yeah. And we've been, he'd been a, somewhat of a role model to me for years. But that system created for a country church, and I yeah. don't know whether it'd be the same in a city church, mm. took a lot of stress out of yeah. uh, out of the whole concept there. So there is some, that one worked. Yes. I don't know whether it would work in other <coughs> areas. Yeah. But for a, particularly for a country church, uh, in a little town, yes. um, that worked very, very well, yeah. um, but the whole management of it was really peculiar as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So. But we've, we've all signed an ethical thing too, haven't yeah. we? And part of that is that we won't be involved yes. in their readers. You guys should read it, mate. Come on. <laughs> I'm sure I did a while ago. <laughs> it's just obviously there are dangers in this yes. whole thing That's as right. well. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So we we've got a church we've got a church that's got a, a solid um, governance structure that is well thought out and capable of of interim <coughs> management and leadership. Um, it's a good idea to have the space, uh, I think, and not to dictate the succession. To be honest, uh, I, I've always felt confident in not being a part of the next process, but saying to a church, I'm going to give you two names. And before you give someone a final thing, I want you to promise you will check with these two people external to the church. Yeah. And I know they're as good at it as I would be. Yeah. So with that in place, what do you need to be a part of? Anymore? That's right, yeah. So um, in a moment, we're going to go through a, a standard exit interview. Um, and uh, um, one, of, one of the things that is common um, in an exit interview is to ask the, the exiting pastor, does he or she have any recommendations that should go to the selection panel? for people that they feel would be a good match for this church. And that's not a bad thing um, to do. It means that, that it's not, you can't dictate it uh, in that sense. Um, but um, part of what I think the danger with the succession thing is that um, uh, influential pastors don't realise how much the church moulds itself to their own personality. And they sort of think, I'm here just as a part, and the church is the church. But actually, the church is their church in, in that thing, and it's not going to be their church in the future. It's going to be someone else's church in a different way. Um, and that, that transition needs to be undone, particularly if the person's been there a long time. Um, and and the, the big danger there is, is churches that break, uh, or they, they, they either break, they will be broken, or they break the next pastor, because they just don't have the flexibility that they need. Okay, do we get, get around any other comments here just on this, the leading paper? Oh, just about the um, quick exit, um, yeah. not recommended. Yes, no, yeah. Um, 
Can I say, just having worked, uh, worked with a lot of pastors through processes like this, um, it really is worth putting a bit of time and effort into doing it well. And that recommendation of having a mentor to journey with you over that time is actually a really good, it's a good time to have a mentor. So if a person doesn't have a mentor for other times in ministry, I really encourage them to get a, a kind of transition mentor. So just have somebody that you can talk this through with. Because um, somebody does need to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, the church is going to struggle to organise a good farewell for you, so you might just have to be instrumental in doing this yourself. That's what I had to do, you know, as I mentioned. Um, and it was really important that that happen. Um, other, otherwise things just slip between the cracks and don't, and don't occur. So what about where a pastor has to leave because of yeah. ill health? Yeah, or, or difficulties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've got a couple who are facing some, some mental illness. Yes. And, uh, yeah, depression and some yeah. other things, but it means they've gone on sick leave and actually won't come back, so they can't leave yeah. yet. Yeah. And that's a whole new dynamic for a... It, it certainly is. Um, I, I still think if it's possible, have some way to affirm them in what they've done in the situation. Um, even if it's fairly quiet, you know, it's around someone's house, doesn't necessarily have to be huge, but to be able to mark it, you know, I think is a really important process. Yeah, that's, that's one particularly to encourage my leadership team to work, what works best for that part yeah. of his family. So yes. a morning service, so it was just too hard, so it was, yeah. uh, it was basically a, yeah. 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 And even things like doing a big card, which you open up to the church, then they can provide yes. feedback, like nice words yep. of affirmation, and then the pastor can leave that in their own time, time. space. Exactly. Well. Yeah. Um, that, that does take that consultation out of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They did, they did that at well, had a box with hearts that people could write on, and then they wrapped that up and gave it. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I thought that that actually be more helpful for the people in the church because yes. yeah. they won't actually see them again. Yeah, um, than the um, than for the pastor who's yeah. going to be talking to his family. So yeah, gave the church something to do. Mm. Good. Yeah, I just attended a, a farewell for uh, one of our pastors, and uh, the, you know I went to preach to speak. But no one came from the church leadership. All of them did not come okay. to that okay. church. Yeah. That's, that's a bit he sad. Because resigned suddenly. Yeah. yeah. And no one came. Yeah. No one came. <laughs> we know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, that's and I speak to one, yeah. went to a fa- final service for a pastor, and we didn't turn up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> didn't turn up. Yeah. Really? Well, church, the, the church did. It's because he didn't get Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah. Sometimes people are really just. Yes. There's mental health issues. Yeah. There's the conflict. And yeah. <coughs> but it's um, having, uh, and we fully acknowledge how painful and difficult it is. But you know, the, the case seats so where none of those elders and all the leaders turned up. Um, that's something that you can't ever change down the track. It's yeah. like. You know, I know some parents who disapprove of a kid's marriage. They choose not to go to the marriage. That's you, you can't undo you can't undo that. Yeah. It's um, it's permanent damage. And, and, and it's a situation like this where there are certain kid situations where I think if you're an independent advisor or a consultant, you need to say, hey, I know that you may not agree with this. I may know you may be hurt. I know this might be painful, but you need to go to this. You know, and you need to say that even if it's painful. You need to say a polite and careful goodbye to this person, and and if those things, because otherwise this just leaves, it leaves a long term hurt for people, mm-hmm. and sometimes people who are independent like us in these circumstances need to <coughs> need to lean on people a bit and say that look there is a right thing to do here, and for your benefit and for everyone else you need to do this. Yeah. Um, you want to continue to be a leader. Yes. Think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and now let's just fully acknowledge how painful and hard that is. Um, uh, because it's it's n- certainly not an easy, not an easy process. Okay, um, so tuck that one away. That's the that's the leaving well. Um, back back to the uh, core tasks. Um, so next one, just the, the celebration and farewells. Um, just make sure these happen. Um, if you're an independent advisor, and you're working um, alongside the pastor and also alongside the elders of a church. 
Um, this is where you possibly need to sit down with the chairperson of the elders and say, you need to organise a proper farewell to this person. Don't just let this go, uh, you know, don't just let this um, drift. Um, particularly if people are having a struggle coming to grips with the fact that the person's actually going, they procrastinate, they put it off, they don't know what to do. Um, you may just need to give them a few ideas on how to do this well, you know, how to have an appropriate um, uh, farewell, you know, um, and, and e even, um, you know, how do you organise it, who do you invite, uh, those sorts of things. People just need a little bit of guidance on that. My experience with this is that people have very good intentions about doing it, but sometimes it just simply falls through the cracks and doesn't happen well. Um, and there's nothing worse than a kind of a farewell that just doesn't work. <laughs> you know, it's not well planned. It falls. Something goes wrong because nobody thought about what they were going to say. Um, and yet, when when there's something that's well planned and well done, it's it's fantastic. So, I was at one of the regional ministry trans changes over in Victoria recently for the Baptists, um, and uh, they they planned the farewell for this person really um, really well. I don't know if I told you about this. They had a huge can like this, and on the outside of the can it had. Um, you know, church health um, wisdom, um, you know, the ability to travel long distances and miles without being tired, you know, um, generosity and kindness to people of all kinds of persuasions and backgrounds, and it had all these things tacked down on the outside of the tin. And this, uh, the senior minister, the, the regional minister picked it up, gave it to the incoming person. He said, here, I've never been able to open it, maybe you'll have more luck. <laughs> 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 it was just great, uh, you know, just reflecting on the, the challenges of the job and, and, you know, what they were, what they were handing in it. So, yeah, so just good, just good moments can, um, can be great. Um, increasingly uh, these days, it's common for a couple of people, um, uh, particularly a few elders, if the relationship has been good, and often an external consultant to do a, pro a formal exit interview. So have any of you been part of of one of those? Okay, good. So that's not uncommon these days. It's, it was never traditionally done in churches. Um, so I've popped in your Dropbox an outline of what that looks like. We'll just pop it up on the screen. Just have a quick look um, because you may find that this is actually something that you, um, as an independent person, get involved in. Oops. All right, we come. Duplicate this time. Um, I'll just go through it very quickly. Tell me whether this is the kind of thing that you've, um, you've seen. So just some simple questions. Um, what are five events, developments, processes on which you look back on in this church with gratitude and joy in your time in leadership? Okay, who's conducting this interview? This is conducted usually by um, a couple of elders in the church and often with an external person present. So it's for the use of the church. Okay. So, um, Are you saying that all the results what's been considered and discussed go to the church? No, it doesn't go to the whole church. It's often it's often kept by the eldership, yeah. um, but it's a chance just for the for the senior pastor to have an opportunity to debrief mm. their ministry with the church. So I've sat with um, oh, quite a number of churches that have done this now. Uh, last one was a couple of months ago, and uh, there would have been three key uh, elders, one, one staff member, two elders from the church and myself. So they actually asked me to run the interview and for them to be present and listen and, and, um, and just into, to collect it up into a report um, that, they, uh, that they processed. Um, three strengths you see in this church community. How could these be maintained and developed in coming years? Uh, in what areas or opportunities do you see the potential life and growth of the church? Uh, what are the contributions you see that you have made to this church? Reflect on your three deepest concerns for the long-term health and growth of the church. What needs to be done to address these? Uh, what were the three most difficult or painful challenges of your time in the church? Are these issues unresolved or relationships left tense or broken? Do you need to do anything for any of these for your own well-being or the well-being of others? Um, sometimes those relationships are with members of the eldership in the church. And so just having a th careful think about who should be on this panel yeah. is, is quite... Do you have a different set for an associate pastor? Um, slightly modified set. Um, uh, you probably just do it as you go, kind of 
Yeah, yeah it's, it's normally the exit interview with an associate pastor is done by the senior pastor. Well, the... Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that would be in, mo in many cases, but not... Um, uh, with maybe with another elder present. Have you got a different experience? Oh, well, we've got someone maybe now. Yep. I've forwarded your questions to... We worked out who would do, do the interview. Oh, we yes. thought it would be best if I did that. Yeah, OK. Well, there's yep. no conflict there. We've no. got a good relationship. We just thought, well, it just frees the person up. Yep, to say. To what they want to say. Yeah. yeah. OK, yep. I don't know, it's just... So yep. Um, I've, I've put these in the Dropbox in doc form so that you can edit them. And, and, and uh, just, just download a copy. Um, out of the Dropbox and edit them up the way you want to use them yourself. So maybe some questions that are more or less um, relevant. Yeah, because it's a lot of questions really. It is, 10, ten or 11 in this one, yeah. Um, uh, three things you, uh, you wish you'd fully understood when you first arrived that you only learned later? That's a good question. You get lots of... Um, <laughs> uh, uh, oh, the important working partnerships or relationships um, in the church. Um, what skills, understand requirements for an incoming pastor are needed? Um, uh, what needs to be in place for the senior pastor in this church in terms of support um, or development? Uh, leave us with some words of wisdom and experience. What would you really like to say to us that you haven't had the opportunity to express? Uh, what question should we have asked you in this interview that we haven't? It's always a good one to ask. Um, I had to do a series of tricky interviews earlier this week and I finished each one with what's the question that I should have asked you in this one that you have an answer for that you haven't had the chance to, to give. So tell me first the question and then second the answer. And, and that was actually really very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a trick question, but it um, gives you good things. So, you, I, I mean, obviously, again, there are good questions you can add or um, reflect on these. So the one that we haven't got in there particularly for a senior pastor, do you have any recommendations for the selection panel as to people that should one consider? In there about the two strengths. Yeah. But um, I, I don't, on this particular version of it, I don't have one about um, do you have the, uh, um, you know, any insight into the, to who might be a good person to, to approach. And so, um, yeah, so, and that, that's often a healthy, a healthy thing to have. It gives, it gives the, the, the retiring pastor or the outgoing pastor the opportunity for a valid input to the selection process without being um, you know, forcing or dogmatic around it and without being manipulative about it. So we can actually, it actually goes formally into this report. Um, this is a recommendation to consider and the selection panel then or the process can look at it um, in an appropriate way without any behind the scenes you know, machinations um, going on. Um, okay with that, with um, with the uh, exit interview. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's in that's in the uh, in the Dropbox. Um, okay, so clarifying the relationship or allow for the grieving process and point E there under one. Um, clarify the relationship with the future minister. It's always good to um, have some kind of a clear understanding and a farewell letter of some sort, without necessarily copying the one in the notes is is useful. Um, another little index page here, you should have somewhere in your notes there, um, should a retiring pastor stay in the congregation? Procedures and principles. So this is from the, uh, the United Church of Christ, the, the UCC in, in America. Um, it's, uh, it's just a resource page, I won't go through it in any detail, just tuck it away and have a look at it. It's got the, the first version of that letter attached to the back, I noticed. Uh, when pastors retire, um, so it's, I think the first version of that one that I, I saw um, just came on the back there. Um, the general rule around this is um, when a pastor retires and leaves the church, um, they really ideally should go, uh, go somewhere else. Um, what's that? <laughs> it's um, the reason why uh, is. Um, even if the person is really thoughtful, well put together, understands all the issues, um, they, they, they become a pole around which discontent organises itself. Even if they've got absolutely nothing to do with it, have no intention of being a part of it and would never step a foot out of line, what happens is that 
People simply use their presence as a organising principle against um, an existing pastor. So they, they, sometimes it's just, it, they, they'll just come up and give them a bit of a nudge and say, well, that wouldn't have happened if you were a pastor, would it? You know, now, you know, just a simple comment like that um, organises the discontent around, around this person. Or... Um, Yeah, well, push, you can give all kinds of pushback, but sometimes they don't even know that they're being used in that kind of a way, you know? So um, it's, it, 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 and it's, very, it's very difficult for, um, for the person themselves. Uh, I mean, it can work because every type of pastor needs to retire somewhere, and why wouldn't you retire in a place where you've got friends, you know, you've, you've had an effective ministry? They all choose to retire to Baptist. Well, they, can yeah. also, they can afford to retire. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but they, particularly if they've, particularly if they've had a ministry in that church or or know people in that church, it becomes a very challenging issue. Um, so, have I told you about the most difficult one that I had to deal with? A, a big church in Queensland, thousand members. Okay, so this it's particularly challenging for a founding pastor in in a large church. Um, and uh, so I've got a, I've, um, if you want to, I'll put a copy in the Dropbox. I've got a whole thing on what happens to founders of organisations or churches when they retire, because the, the founder transition is the biggest <coughs> and most challenging one of all. My issue is he wasn't the pastor straight before me. Okay, yeah. He's yep. come back. Yes, right, yeah. And another one has stayed on as well. So yes. it's, just, it's a nice church to be, I understand that. Yeah. But why me? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so the, um, th this particular situation, he, had, he and his wife had spent over 20 years and they'd built a church from nothing, it's a big Pentecostal church, nothing to over a thousand members. They'd started a school, a very successful school in the suburbs, which now had over a thousand students involved in the school. So it was a big, big enterprise. And he had quite a nice office with leather seats and couches. And so he, he invited me to come in and facilitate the transition to the new uh, incoming senior pastor. So it, as a part of the process, he said, so I'm, I'm really working hard, handing over everything, so he will have my office, and my new office will be built downstairs, <laughs> and <laughs> where I can kind of become the grandfather of it. So he'll be the father of the church, and I'll be the grandfather of the church. And so I'm talking here like a serious piece of office work. This, he had a dais, a circular dais with a circular bookcase around the back and his big desk and right in the middle of it and then downstairs with his big couches area you know where you, where you, you, you talk to things leather beautiful leather couches and all of that any rate um, so uh, I was with a, another person we were consulting together on this and we actually realised this this was heading for a serious disaster um, there's no way in the world the, the incoming pastor could survive and so I had to say to this, this pastor um, you and your wife need to leave this church and w when I sat them down together and told them that they both, they both started to weep and they said, we, we have no life but in this church. We have no friends but friends here. We, our whole, everything, our family is here. Our life is here. And you're telling us that we have to turn our backs on, on our children, our family, our heritage, everything that, that it is. He said, this is just too painful. We can't, we can't do that. Um, and uh, um, anyway, we, we spent a lot of time in the process to talk through it. And eventually he agreed that he and his wife needed to move and go somewhere else for the sake of the transition, for the sake of the church. And two years later, he rang me back. And he said, he said when you said to us that my wife and I had to leave this church, we thought, we thought that was the worst thing that could possibly happen to us in our lives and that we would never survive it. But having to done it, he said, I need to ring you back and tell you it's the best thing that we ever did because we created a new situation for ourselves. It set us free, it set the church free to grow and succeed. Um, and, it, and he said, I think we would have killed it if we had stayed. Mm -hmm. And so the church continued on and, and continued on well. Um, and I met one of the people who were on the leadership team later and they said that was one of the best things, decisions we ever made as a team is that we had to follow that through and, and stick with that. So hard, tough, but incredibly important to happen. Now obviously successful pastors have got to go somewhere um, and that <laughs> 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 <laughs>
you want to start the address. 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 there probably should be a church somewhere that's just dedicated to this with... with Former pastors. There's three Okay, yeah. There's three. Yeah, it's a... Um, that is a significant challenge to, to work this out. Um, and particularly to work out the, you know, the issues around um, uh, continued involvement of a former pastor in a church. Um, is hard. So that one of the, the that, that letter where it, where it says, "I am no longer your pastor. Thank you for your loyalty to me. Um, you now need to give this loyalty to your incoming um, senior pastor." Um, and I and I need to say to you, I am not available for funerals and weddings and, and those sorts of things. That, that's very painful for people, who, particularly if you've had a long ministry. You know, you know, people have known you and the family. They want that they want someone they know, you know, to to minister to them in a in a time of need. Uh, so it's hard, it's hard, it's a hard call, but when it happens, it completely undermines the leadership of the new pastor in that location and space. And so it's got to be worked out carefully how, if and if, if you ever, how you do it, how you include, um, you know, the, the the person involved in it. Um, so I've I've seen them, I've seen it work a couple of times successfully, where, you know, if with a big significant funeral, um, a former pastor has come back, but the present pastor leads significant moments in the funeral and then hands over to the other pastor to do maybe the eulogy or the committal or, or something like that. So. Phil, we okay? and I, Phil and I have done a bit of that. Okay, so yeah. Phil has had come. So yeah. It's been pretty good, I think. Like, yeah. And I don't think, I don't feel like you can have a blank of will. No, no for sure. There are people that really are elderly, yes. hardly know me. Yeah. Really attached to Phil. Yeah. But as long as they can see we've got a good relationship. Yes. And I've got to admit, when times come where I've taken the funeral, yeah, it's been very significant yes. for them starting to adjust to me. Exactly. Yeah. So you've got to make that transition. Yes. Can you? Yeah. 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 It's an interesting reflection. It? it is. I was like, aren't they actually dead when you're? <laughs> That's that, that, yeah. old fashioned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Get with it. <laughs> get, get with it. I'm talking about all the other ones that are almost dead. Tim, <laughs> how does this work? Because this is all very part in past the same yes. yeah. models rather than plurality of yep. leadership models. Yes, yeah. So I'm just thinking through this, I'm thinking through where is this in the Bible, and I'm also thinking through, yeah, the, the dependent leadership, yeah. dependence of culture. Yeah. One yes. You can do have a model of plurality. Then yeah. What does that look like? Yes. Yeah. 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 Have you seen models like that? Oh, certainly. Yes. So, I mean, uh, again, the, the transition of people in teams and team environments uh, is, is is quite different. Um, you've got a, there's a whole range of other issues to work out in in terms of a team context to how this works, because there is a school of thought that says when the leader goes, everyone goes, and it all gets changed around. Um, and uh, but I, uh, again, I'm, I'm, it's a it's a challenge to work those things out um, out well. Uh, I do agree that we are often pastor centric around this, and there's not much in the scriptures that even talks really about the role of pastor as such as as a unique ordained role in any sense. It's really about body life. Um, so again, we we face those realities of working that through. Uh, it's it's a it's a consequence of the way we do pastoral ministry in churches that we end up with these these kinds of transitional issues. Yeah. yeah. So if they're not doing it in that way, I was thinking about some of the churches that are being started now, and they're yeah. not in this model. No, that's right. And I go, well, then what does that look like moving forward? Yeah. That new, more committed to your church. I yeah. Think small boats, an example, like one of the early adopters in some of that stuff, and might yeah. even move on. Yeah. Um, but there was... I don't think Mike would even know as the, the kind of key leader in all of that. There was a bunch of other really influential people that are still there, still holding significant leadership positions. Yeah, yeah so I'm, it's just something that I'm personally wrestling with in our context, but also yeah. seeing a whole new crop of churches coming through that are slightly different. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Some, uh, um, some of the new churches, though, are, are um, 
remarkably pastor centric, even if the person is not recognised as a pastor. They're, they're remarkably leader centric. Yeah. So, you know, I had the sad responsibility of, of working with a church that's ha- was a church plant, very successful. I think I mentioned to you last time, last Sunday, on last Sunday, they closed. Um, you know, after, you know, running a pretty successful um, church plant, um, pretty major leadership um, failure, but there was nothing in the remainder of the church that enabled the group to be able to be self functioning. Yeah, and I suppose my, the heart behind my, my question in this is, is are we perpetuating a broken model yeah. by keeping it pastor centric, mm. uh, whether it's a church plant or an existing church? Yeah. Uh, where you're at. Yep. Yeah. Now's, now's not the time to answer those questions. No, that, that's. that's right. Yeah. I just look at the number of pastors in our movement, and this is something you, Ian, and I have been reflecting on, that you know, are facing burnout and the issues surrounding that. Issues around up person leaving, yeah. issues within a church with up person. I go, oh, yeah. yeah, is there something else? Yeah. Um, and then how does that impact all of this? Yeah. Good, good question, good call. Yep. Um, multi campus, multi site sort of churches. Have you got a view there around? Yeah, there's a few questions here. Um, if a pastor at one of the campuses goes, are they able to go to one of the other campuses if they're staying in the area? That and the role of the if it's a okay if it's a, a network of churches and there's a senior pastor over the network the role of that senior pastor then in in, in, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a number of different models around that work in that way with different levels of governance and control mm-hmm. around the relationship of the satellite to the mother church, um, and so they they some of them govern them differently. Some of them the you know the senior pastor appoints the pastor yeah. for for the other churches where if there's any internal movement of one to another, that would happen at the discretion of the, the senior pastor. Um, if, if a pastor, though, at, at one of the campuses, so to speak, concludes there, yeah. are they able to attend one of the other churches in the movement where they're not identified as the lead pastor? In that yeah, uh, that has, certainly has happened and, and can work. But again, it depends on the level, the, the way that the, the various congregations or um, you know, campuses actually work. Uh, in that environment, so um, in some cases, people don't know people in the other ones at all, yeah. including the congregational pastor for that particular um, group. Um, so yeah, and so th- and there are other types of networks um, around the country where people do move, you know, um, across um, pastoral positions within the network without any trouble at all, and and may finish up in one and just attend another. So. Um, are we okay with that? Are you happy to we'll just take over? What, how are we going for time? Are we happy for a three o'clock um, short afternoon tea break? Five minutes? Fine. Yep, and then uh, we'll be finished pretty um, sharp on four. Is that okay? Focus today? Yep, good. All right, um, so just a few more minutes before we, um, we break here. Um, Helping the church to reflect on their past season of leadership. So this is where, as a consultant, just helping them process their past journey. So um, simple little tools um, like a SWOT analysis, a timeline, helping the church just process through where they're up to. Um, Using a storytelling evening. Have we been through that resource as yet? That might be coming up. Um, Running a storytelling uh, evening, just helping a church identify the core values that it has as a church through the stories they celebrate about their life and history as a church. It's a great, it's a great little um, evening um, where you just gather people together and you, you map the stories up on a whiteboard that people tell and then you ask those people to sit back and say, what, why do we tell this story? What's the value that we have as a church that, that is hidden in this story? So my, my own church has got a couple of favourite stories. They love to tell everybody who comes, you know, about uh, um, particularly, in, uh, it goes back now to the good old days, uh, to the period of the 1980s when we had a whole bunch of alternative lifestyle people shift out of Melbourne and Sydney and come and live in the valleys behind our town. And over the course of a couple of years, we had 25 of them come to Christ. Um, it was a really significant period in the life of our church. And we've only got one of them that's still there, uh, who, who married, uh, most of them got their lives together and moved back to Melbourne and Sydney, <laughs> most of um, uh, We had one of them dropping a little while ago who came to celebrate um, uh, being back in the church. Um, uh, but uh, 
uh, that's the, the, you know, the, the stories that we tell about people's transformation uh, and the church being willing to reach out to people of a completely different sort of background. Um, and so um, that's a value that we need to find. How do we reinvest that now? You know, how do we find a new way to do exactly that? That's the challenge that we face. Um, reflecting. So a storytelling evening is a good way of just helping the church open up um, and reflect on that. Um, just working through um, the, the processes of change and even running a little bit of a workshop on, um, so you obviously you wait for the former minister to go before you do this one, but what elements of the previous minister's leadership need to live on, find a new way to be re-expressed, just to be let die naturally or be intentionally transformed into something new. And so um, that's actually been an important discussion that we've had, um, particularly with the leadership um, of several ch uh, churches. Um, rebooting the system. So this is what we mean by, um, you know, kind of doing a, a, a computer reset, you know, with Windows after you've got an upgrade come through. You kind of you have to switch off and switch back on again um, and uh, hope the whole thing starts. Um, go, just going back to a chance to kind of reboot the church, back to vision, identity, values. Um, asking the core questions. Who are we as God's people in this place? What are the unique challenges or tasks that are becoming clear to us? Who's God calling us to serve and disciple? What values is God calling us to embrace in living? Um, what's unique about the way that we do church uh, here? So this is a chance just to go back to kind of the core stuff and revisit that. And it's really good to do that at a time of pastoral uh, transition because it helps people just... Um, we are a group of people independent of the pastor who leads us. Does that make sense? And that helps us rejig um, just a few things um, in here. So it gives that, that healthy sense. Um, gaps and laps overlap uh, analysis, we did that last time we were together, and the key roles of a pastor uh, in the church. It's a good idea just to reflect on those. So uh, if there's a solo pastor situation, there's 12 roles. If it's just as a senior pastor and there's a staff team, there's 10 roles. And I think I've got both. I'd have to check that, but I think I've got both documents in your... Um, the Dropbox there. Um, a little bit of a leadership reset um, is point C. Um, I think we're all aware effective church ministry is a partnership between the governing lay leaders in the church and the minister. Um, when you change one, you're having a significant impact on the other. And so the thing needs to go up for a little bit of a revisit and having a think about what happens. Regardless of how good, inclusive and open every minister is, they always do leadership in a particular way that favours some people and is less friendly to others. It's just, that's just a reality. Um, it's not, not a bad thing, it's just the way that all leaders work. When there's a leadership change, sometimes you need just to do some refiguring and including people that may not have felt as comfortable working closely with this previous leader as they, as they would with somebody else. And so some of those people have sat on the sidelines for a little while and ha for whatever reason have not been as fully involved as they could have been. And this is a great chance just to, to re-include people, even if a different group of people find themselves working closely you know, with the next minister. It's just a natural, pro sometimes it's personality, sometimes it's theology, sometimes it's um, just, just you know, ways of doing things, methodologies, ways of approaching things. Um, people warm to some people and not as much to others. Nothing wrong with that, it's just the way life works. Um, but but it's, it would, it's dangerous not to understand that when you're helping a church process um, this time of, uh, of reflection. So having a look at the leadership structure and reflecting on the needs for any specific leadership empowerment that might need to take place at that particular time. Um, having a quick look at the key partnerships the church is involved in. These days most churches have links to things like mission groups, um, non, uh, uh, Christian mission organisations, Sometimes overseas things, got all kinds of churches who do, you know, trips to Cambodia or trips to Fiji or all those sorts of things. This is a good time just to check in, is that stuff, you know, appropriate, right, working? Was it the vision of one particular leader and it's actually never been really embedded in the life of the church? Is it the right thing to keep on doing? Um, those sorts of things just become important to help a church uh, consider. Um, Possibility of a little bit of a church health review in there. It's a good time to do that. Um, 
and then um, doing a little bit of reflection on um, uh, the transition journey. Um, this is back to the wilderness um, thing here. Um, just know what Egypt is for, the, for this church, what they, they want to go back to. Um, sometimes it's back to the leadership of the former pastor. Um, so there's always going to be a little bit of anxiety about leaving that behind um, and genuinely moving forward. Um, there, there's always a few unexpected gifts of provision in the desert um, or the neutral space, so there's your manna. Um, you've got to send out a few spies to see and find out what the future looks like. Um, believe in the promise of getting to the promised land. Um, and then our three little things I've been saying all day, communicate, 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 and pray, pray, pray about um, the time of transition. And then you help the church work towards the kind of um, uh, transition towards the future that it might need in terms of a new pastor. So sometimes you're invited to be a part of helping that selection process uh, be formed. Uh, other times um, you're not, and often there are denominational processes that kick in at that point that, <coughs> that become quite, um, quite important. Um, I've been asked on several times to, um, to help the church just compile its criteria for selection um, and, and to do that prayerfully and thoughtfully and so to actually consult with the church around what the six criteria might be that we might be looking at in how to discern before God the right kind of um, about the way to go about it um, in, in you know, seeking a person and the way, then the criteria to use in our reflection um, on this. So I had a rather interesting conversation with someone just this last week on Tuesday um, around this question who basically said no, there's no such thing as a selection process when it comes to a pastor um, for a church. Um, this is a spiritual discernment before God and we only ever have one candidate and that's the right one. And, and, and so the, the task before God is to search out prayerfully that right person without going through a process of criteria and selection. Now, I'm, I'm a bit of a believer that God can guide and discern through those processes as much as he can independently of them. Um, but that was just in, you know, interesting. He, he was just feeling that in many cases, uh, churches just get so um, hung up on running through a, you know, like a, a kind of merit-based selection process that they forget that this is about discerning um, what the Spirit of God is saying to a church about who um, is the right match for them to take them forward regardless of necessarily the meritocracy that we kind of work on. So, which is, well, it's a good, good call, but yeah. But just got to be put in, into context. Um, so we're okay with that? That's one more little document to work through. Can you skip over Paul pretty quickly? I, I don't did. think we've covered church health. Is there some standard set of questions that you have? Yes, yeah, we certainly do. Uh, early as part of this context rather than waiting for a couple of months for the church health? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can certainly do that. I've got a, I've got a standard series of seven, um, just a kind of a self-assessment for people and mm -hmm. for a consultant to work through with church people on seven common measures of church health. Okay. Yep. So I'm happy to drop that in the Dropbox if you like, but that, that's all coming up in when we do... I'm sure it'll come up soon, yeah. but it's been introduced here. It has, that's right. Yep, okay, all right, I can have, I'm happy to. Thank you. All right, so there's, there'll be a, a section on church health. I hope so. Um, yeah, yeah no, and so I'll try and, I'll yeah. try and activate that. Yeah, good. We okay for just a five minute break? Yeah. Um, quick recharge, glass of water, not too long. Yeah. Okay, folks, just one more resource to go through, and then um, I'd like us to just to finish off the last uh, 15, 20 minutes of the day, just getting you back to where we started which is thinking through current transitions that you are facilitating, managing, or interacting with people around. What are important steps out of today that you might um, just adjust or fine tune or take around, around these? So the last one here says transitional consultancies, and it's um, ad adapted from IIM training. Now, so most of you are aware of intentional interim ministry. Pretty, it's pretty well there. So this is just a quick little revisit of um, the five tasks of intentional interim ministry, what intentional interims do. Um, increasingly around uh, church health consulting worlds, um, consultants are journeying with churches doing these five tasks while a non-intentional interim does the looking after of the church, more almost like a, a chaplain. So run services, does things, keeps the pastoral care going, does the teaching and teaching, 
but is not skilled in helping the church actually do the transitional work underneath the surface. And so they've actually had church health consultants come in and journey with a, what's called a transitional team to do the five tasks um, while somebody else looks after the church. Does that make sense? That's exactly what we're doing. Exactly what you're doing? Well, okay. as in, I'm the transitional consultant. Yes. And they've got a interim uh, pastor. Yes, so it's not, but it's not an intentional interim. So, yeah, great. So in, in the classic um, part of this model, the intentional interims are trained by Transitional Ministries Australia, and they do these five tasks that we're about to go through. Um, and that's a key part of their work, as well as preaching, teaching, doing the pastoral care, um, keeping the church ticking over. This is a way to get both things happening, but not with the, um, the, the interim. So in many cases, it's a retired pastor who comes and does a kind of like a locum there for a period of time, but is supported underneath the surface by a couple of church health consultants um, who come and actually do the transitional consulting work with the church. So it's much the same that we've talked about all day. Um, the five tasks, um, just down there, we'll go through those very quickly. And then just talk about the role of a transitional team. Um, one of the things that makes nearly all of our um, specialist consultancies a little different to a standard consultancy is the use of a local team in the local church to do quite a bit of the work themselves. And that's very true in a transitional consultancy. Often we are um, seeking to appoint three, four, five people in the local church who basically become a transition team. They, they work for perhaps just a period of, um, might be seven, or eight, nine months, sometimes up to two years. Um, if it's that, if that's long for a transition, um, they um, do the background work um, around these five tasks and, and write actually a report um, for the church under the coaching and assistance of um, one or two church health consultants. So I think you're all familiar with this, so we won't take too long. Um, the five tasks, coming to terms with the history. So this is basically um, helping the church uh, understand who it is, where it's come from, um, what's going on. So as I've done this with churches, I commonly use a timeline exercise. So this is helping the church. We actually, we'll, we'll sit down in a room, we'll, we'll put out a timeline on the floor of the key events that have happened in the life of this, of this church um, and uh, go through um, particularly how people were um, connected to these events, the history, what the church was like, uh, what happened. So um, uh, Kevin will know this one, but I, we did this in a, a large church in Newcastle a while ago, and we had to ask where will we start. And the important date in this church was the Newcastle earthquake. That's that was the starting date. So we put the earthquake down, mm -hmm. number one. And then you know you had the basically the uh, tenure of each major pastor, you know, through the, the church down um, down through the time, and then um, the key moments um, that occurred in the history of the church. Um, so sometimes I have two or three lines out. So one might be you know, uh, communal events that have happened in the, in the, the community uh, or the place. There might be church events that have taken place and then there might be key um, other things that have, you know, influenced the life and the ministry of this church uh, in this place. Um, a timeline is, is a really powerful exercise, um, particularly if you're working with a leadership team in a church. Um, where did they join, you know, in with the church? And then um, I've often asked people to walk down the timeline and tell me um, what was happening for them, what was happening in the church at various points. And then to stand at the end, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually it's a great exercise to physically do this. Put it out, put the timeline on pieces of paper on the floor, lay them down, and physically get people to walk down the timeline. This is where this happened. And then I ask them to stand here and tell me what do they see. Now, spiritually, what do they see in the life of the church? Sometimes people say, I just see a lot of pain and, and a lot of hurt. I think we've got to, it's something we've got to deal with here. And so I say, where do you see this? You know, and they might say, here and here. Um, and then the most powerful thing we can do is to ask them to turn around and tell me what to, where, where, take a step forward and tell me where the church is going. You know, what's, what's happening? What's the next step? Um, and you get some really powerful um, reflections. If you've got a group of five elders, um, and you've worked through a little exercise like that with them, it's a really quite a potent exercise of reflection and thought around, you know, who are we? What's our history? Where are we going? What do we see as our future? What's the next step um, to take here? 
and then we've often just gathered. We've often, you know, prayed for the person and their, you know, their role and leadership in the church, and, and um, said, you know, we're here to, because the next part of this journey is us all taking a step together into into the future. So what's it going to look like? Where are we going to go? You know, what direction are we heading in in here? So th- and those sorts of little exercises can be very um, just potent um, for a church in terms of helping um, people um, reflect and read. And you also pick up some really valuable information um, as people journey and reflect uh, down through here. So that's, that's a timeline exercise. Um, uh, helping people think through where the pains might have been. Is there anything that's unresolved, anything that needs to be fixed in the life of this church? Um, so sometimes you, th- you, you, you know that a church is actually stuck on an issue back here that was never never sorted out. And so one of the questions might be, what do we need to do to resolve this piece of our history? What, what needs to happen here? And sometimes just consulting um, with the church, what do we need to do? What do we need to, to fix? Um, becomes important. So in uh, one case I worked with a church, I think I've, I've told, I might have shared, I forget where I've shared what story. Um, we flew a former pastor and his wife back uh, to the church and the church, we couldn't change the past, but the church had the opportunity to formally apologise to them about the way in which they were dealt with and treated and uh, ask their forgiveness and then release the pastor and his wife to, to fly back into state. Um, it was a very, very poignant moment. They, they paid for that to happen, they put them up in a nice hotel for the weekend and they just said, look, this is just, we've got to come to grips with our history and there's many people in this church that believe you were treated badly. So that was a... Um, that was a moment in a consultation where you test the waters. So, so did I tell you this? So basically what happened is this came forward in the, as a suggestion from somebody that, 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 that yes, we have a wounded part of our history uh, that we've never dealt with and we've never actually talked about it as a church. And I believe strongly that a former pastor and his wife were badly mistreated by this church and that we owe them an apology and we need to repent as a church. And so when something like that happens, you have no idea as a consultant, does just one person feel like this? Does everybody feel like this? Mm-hmm. So I asked, it's, it's occurred in a large room, there were probably 60 people in the room, and we were reflecting on the history together, and I asked, how many people believe that this is such a, an important event that the church needs to do something about it? You know, it can't just be left. And if you'd like to do, just come and stand on this side of the room, how many people believe it would be best just to let this go, and it doesn't need to be acted, come and stand on this side of the room? One person and everybody else. Re- people got straight up and went and stood over here. Uh, I thought, whoa, okay. Th- this is. Uh, the I guess we won't do anything there. No. So, <laughs> just ask the <laughs> so in, in that moment, there was, you know, there was an absolutely clear mandate. We, we needed to do something. So we talked about, well, what do we do? And somebody said, we need to fly them back. And everybody nodded. You know, we need to, to invite them down for a weekend and apologise to them. And everybody nodded. And so, I said, well, I mean, I think that person realised. I mean, we were just asking for honest reflections here. No judgment of each other. Just what, you, what do you honestly think? And, and the, you know, the, the, no judgment about this person. I think he probably just didn't know what was, you we've know. We've got a level of judgment, man. <laughs> 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 yeah. 59 other men. I, I can't remember. I, got, I think he might have even left that corner and came over and stood on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but that, that gave us a very, so, so again, when that came back in the report, we need to fly this couple down and have a, have a weekend um, and then hold a formal moment where the church apologises to them about the way that in which they were treated. Um, that's, that was 100% clear, no, you know, no problem in, in approving that when the report came out because people had been at the meeting and they'd saw, seen what had happened and they'd felt that yes, that's what we need to do. Um, so that was, um, and, and it was a very meaningful thing when it actually happened. It was, it was releasing for the, for the uh, they were only young pastors, um, releasing for the young guy and his wife, um, to actually, they were a bit nervous about coming down because they had been badly treated. Um, but when, when told what would happen and why and wh- where the church was up to, what the process they were currently going through, they actually felt quite um, uh, well respected and treated to be do to have that done, and it helped them move on in their own lives um, as well. Um, so that's coming to grips with history. Um, second one is just re-examining the organisational and leadership needs. This is the this is the classic unscrewing the system 
Um, look, uh, just talking about what's going on in leadership, what do we need, what does this church need, does it need to be in a different place, does it, does it need to have rethought um, its leadership and organisational structure. Um, so again, one of the, I think, I, I forget where I've told what's your story, one of the most, um, uh, what would you say, meaningful consultations I've ever been in was I was called in in a situation like this, the minister had left, church was in transition, and they said we've burned out our last three pastors. Did I tell you this last one? Yeah. So what do we need? What do we need to do to change the way we, as a group of, and this is an Anglican church group of wardens, relate to our pastor? Because something's wrong in our systems, our processes. We're certainly not intentional around this. We want to look after our next pastor. So help us redesign our organisational leadership interaction, so that we can actually make sure we look after the next pastor that comes. Uh, to our church, so that was just that was an opportunity here. You can't do it when the pastor's there. You know, it needed to happen in this transitional moment. So, looking at the organisational needs, um, the way ministry works, the way leadership works, are we incorporating younger people? Are we empowering uh, new leaders? How do we structure that part of the process? Um, rethinking denominational linkage. Um, you're all here, part of the denomination in this sense. Many of the um, larger, more successful churches slowly decrease their denominational linkage over time. And so it's, it's not uncommon, particularly for the more successful churches, to be kind of go-it-alone style churches. And if I can say this honest, and honestly, some churches have a larger staff budget than the whole denomination. You know, in terms of some of the bigger ones, they run their own massive processes. Some of them have multiple staff. Um, you know, and so they, they say, well, why would we, you know, why would we stay connected in that sense if we do it all ourselves anyway? Um, but this is a really good time just to, to help a church reconnect to its, who it is, its denominational linkage, um, to serve them in an in a appropriate moment. Because transition is, while it's healthy and good, it's also a vulnerable time. And so reconnecting denominationally is a really important element. And as consultants, we can actually help that happen uh, constructively and well. Um, just over the page, deepening a sense of identity, developing fresh vision. Um, so this is a chance just for the church to go back to those core principles. We talked about them on the previous page. Um, where are we going as a church? What's our, what's our unique um, calling of God in this locality to do what kind of ministry here? So who is it that we're called to reach? How do we do this? What kind of a church are we? Uh, how are we different from other churches in our locality? Um, what kind of approach to ministry do we have? What's uniquely us? Um, How much should a church at this stage drill down into vision without the new senior pastor yeah. being there? Yeah. So um, we we here. I think did we do d the the ch dual visions of the church last time that we were here? No. Okay. Every church has got two visions, not one, and they need they need to integrate, but they need to be they need to be distinct, and so. There's a vision that is anchored in community and locality and it belongs to the people that are in a church. If they've got no vision about who they are, how they want to be God's people in this place, long term, to reach this community long term, beyond the tenure of any one pastor who comes, they've got no idea who to select as a pastor to lead them in that journey. And so that, that vision is resident within the people of the church and particularly within the lay leaders of the church and it needs to be there to be healthy. They don't always know how to do that. And so they need a pastor. <laughs> they need a they need a pastor. <laughs> Leave well. <laughs> um, they need to have a pastor who knows how to do ministry. And and pastors come often with a philosophy of ministry um, with a, a, a way of being church together that is actually not so much about locality because they've had to move it's actually about how do I do church how do I do ministry, how do I do um, the kingdom you know, uh, leadership and so that they need to anchor that more generic vision inside a vision for locality and people in a place um, which has got a theology of location of place and the people in the place need to find out how to do this here 
with a leader who can lead them in an area of ministry. So we call this sort of ministry vision and community vision. And it's, it's like a, a, set, a set of glasses. You need the two. <laughs> you know, you're going to get depth of field if you've, if you've got the vision coming from two different things that, 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 com- that successfully combine into one way forward. But a pastor's got to realise he or she doesn't have it all themselves. They don't understand this community, this place. They need the local people to tell them about that. And they know that they need leadership to get where they want to go. And so, so this is what we call the, the dual vision. And this is doing one side of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they're ready now then to invite the other person on the other side of that into the leadership um, to do it. Um, is that one of the challenges, Tim, around the founding pastor piece? Because yeah. they are both of those Exactly teams. right, so exactly, the yeah. The ministry and the community are one. Yeah, so that's right. So the church has got to go on this, yep. almost work out that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Because they've got to disconnect the two. Yeah. Because it, it often in the case where there's been a founding pastor of a new church, the whole thing's come together in the one, yeah. the one environment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we haven't covered that. Sorry, I, I thought that was there. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's called that's called the stereo vision of a church. So I, I'm, again, on my website, you can just there's an article up there on that. But we'll cover that in training. I thought we'd had we've done that, but you never know. All right. Good. <laughs> Uh, last dot point, um, helping them prepare for new pastoral leadership. So this is um, helping them, if they haven't yet worked out exactly how the, uh, the selection process is going to happen, um, how do they actually prepare for this, can they come up with the, you know, the criteria they're looking for, the kind of match. And so, um, again, one of the more encouraging ones I was a part of some years ago, um, we actually held a Sunday afternoon discernment process around the characteristics of a ministry leader that the church was really looking for. You know, and trying to get away from superwoman or superman view, uh, we, we, what, what unique features are we looking for in somebody who will suit this church? You know, realising you can't get, you know, super, super person, you know, unless Christ returns to come back and be your pastor. Um, so let's be realistic, but what are the important ones? Church came up with eight that were really quite, just quite valuable and unique and important and there were four or five candidates and when the interview panel uh, walked through there was one person that all eight just was a perfect fit just just and they, they suddenly realized this is, this is the person we've been praying about you know um, this is the kind of approach to leadership that, that works for us um, and it was a really encourage that person had a really a very effective ministry for eight or nine years in that place it was a great great match and it came out of a, a, an afternoon of discerning the the characteristics that they were looking for as a as a church. So uh, leading the transition, putting together a team um, of people just to work through those tasks and basically it's, it's you, can, you don't do those tasks for them, you coach them as they, as they do the tasks uh, together. Um, there's a couple of uh, just final closing comments about transitional uh, ministry there but it's actually a very valid way to pastor a, a church through a period of, um, of uh, transition. Uh, any question, comment on that? But most of you, you've seen intentional interim ministry work, you know what it's like. This is just an alternative to that model, which um, Kevin was saying obviously is happening in certain places already. Okay, pretty close to time. Um, just an opportunity, uh, just as we finish up, um, just to take your learning out of today, um, just reflect for a few moments on a current transition that you are working with either in your own church or uh, supporting or consulting with others um, around transition. What's a, what's a significant learning out of today that you've been thinking of or working through that you can actually use on the ground um, either in your own church or in a, another place um, just to help the transition be perhaps... Um, uh, done with, with more pastoral sensitivity and care or, um, you know, a greater level of, um, of communication or to help it just to transition smoothly and well. So we've got a moment just to take that and think. Let's just chair those around and we'll pray for each other as we close. I think we've got a... Um, head, is that heading off in a few minutes? Yeah. Yeah, um, as I mentioned very early on, the beginning of when we were talking, is that... Um, 
in a church at the moment where we're starting to relook at our vision and how we're going to live in the community and where we want to go. So just the whole, I guess, the, the big picture, the meta picture of what you've shared yeah. today in terms of the structure of it. This, you, I could go through the whole lot, tick the whole lot out in one sense, but um, yeah, it's just uh, the structural thought process with that. Um, very useful in the, for the time to let it um, sink in and work out how I can take it forward from there. Mm. Okay. Good. Good. See you later, Brent. See you later, Brent. Actually, question? yeah, two just reinforcements. One in one situation just to, to slow the process down, or not rush yeah. through the transition period. But yeah. it's, um, there's still some learning to go on, even though it's, you know, to remind mm. them that actually stuff is happening, even yes. though it yeah. feels like nothing's happening. Mm. And um, but finishing well yeah. is another. Yeah. So really encouraging us to you know, make sure that that happens. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A, a good finish enables a good start, and yeah. and that's a key key thing. No, yeah. Just, yeah. Just like you've done for this yeah. Project. How you finish here has direct. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure actually. Like a lot of this seemed to revolve around pastors leading. Yes. Like something I'm involved with or doing. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. But I am taking note of intention. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'm just about to start involvement with church that's halfway through a transition. Okay. So I'm trying to pick up mid midpoint. Yep. And going through the process a little bit. Um, and as I understand it, the issue is that they haven't done previous two appointments very well. Right. And so they need to understand what they're looking for better. Yeah. So, um, but I'm at the beginning of that year and I'll, I'll probably have more reflect on this one. Yes, okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. The thing I've been wrestling with today is probably more how all of this and the previous ones will work in relation to how you start churches. Yeah. So starting with kind of the end in mind. Yes. Yeah. And what does it look like to shape expectations of church mm. plans, but also as you build and develop <coughs> structures and processes that actually facilitate healthy yeah. transition mm. rather than just not even yeah. thinking about it. Yes. But knowing that that's not actually the focus or what they want to look at, but yeah, yeah the, the type of culture that you create yes. um, yeah. is really important. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, so that would be culture around high levels of trust, of communication, yep. clarity around expectations, even acknowledging that the, the way things start are not going to be the way they continue forever. Yep. Um, and, and how that, but it, it's always going to be transitions, and there's natural transitions that take place. Yeah, even in the healthiest of churches. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Good. Good. Um, so much in here, I think, for lots of different circumstances. But I think communicating mm -hmm. and the whole intentional communication, yeah. Yeah. constant communication, and communication in different ways, like we talked about earlier with the personality stuff. Mm. Um, again, there, there would be a couple of things I wanted to make sure we got through today, and maximum communication is is one. That that transitions are always eased by good planning and good communication, and lots of it. Yeah. The stuff on bio briefs and how to communicate to the various people that that really helps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just to understand from that triangle of like that's what yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of you, if you're, if you're not familiar with the Myers-Briggs, there's mountains of stuff out there on the internet, right? And particularly what, is, what are called the eight cognitive functions, which describe the four uh, inner processes in both uh, what's called an introverted and an extroverted mode. So it's introverted feeling, extroverted feeling, introverted thinking, extroverted think uh, extra introverted intuition, extroverted intuition. Um, the most recent research on um, neurology is that those eight processes are detectable in the brain, which is quite interesting because there's a little bit of doubt about whether the Myers-Briggs holds much mm -hmm. ac academic and intellectual water. But the latest stuff coming out of um, UCLA 
in um, California is that you can detect those eight cognitive processes occurring <coughs> in different parts of the brain. And so, so they, can actually, they can see them in different things, you know, lighting up when you've got those what, 24 things I stick on your head, monitor your cortex. So it is actually quite observable, which is interesting. There's not, there's not a validity at the moment for the 16 types, but there is a validity for the eight processes. So that's quite, uh, quite clear. Good. Uh, the thing for me is allowing people to uh, assimilate information into good speeds. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think you're giving them freedom to do so, but also giving them the right to not necessarily get on board yeah. straight away. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good. Pastoral sensitivity to the speed at which people assimilate change is really, really important. Good. by the role of followers. Yes. I'm going to try that dance on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 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 Take the shirt off in church. <laughs> <laughs> you possibly may not get any first <laughs> <laughs> <first followers. laughs> followers. Well, uh, but his church will be up for a transition after that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 Is that leaving well? Very well, actually. So, I'm like, I'm leaving my church through a process of revisioning. Yes. Um, we're taking our time. We started at the beginning of the year. And um, one of the things that we've struggled to do is to really engage with some of the other ethnic groups okay, that yeah. are represented yeah. in our church. And I wonder if um, one way we can do that is by identifying the first followers okay, yes. in those groups. Yeah. Who for cultural reasons may not feel that they can contribute to the, the um, yeah. survey. also just the, the value of communication in the transition process and and I guess the sense that, that churches don't need to do this alone mm. yeah. and say in my own case a neighbouring church yeah. an associate from that became a transitional pastor yeah. even though he's still an associate of that church, that church. Yeah. and just how healthy that is yeah. and the message yeah. it communicates broader yeah, um, yeah. yeah so Okay. Um, Can I yes, yes. build on what Kev said? What I found really quite compelling for both the Hunter and the Greater West, two yep. of our regions, is the way they are actually breaking some of the rules and parachuting pastors in from one church to another for a certain period of time because yes. of a certain skill set. Yep. And I think AJ is a great example. And I think yep. I find that really compelling. And I think it does break the, the models yes. of some of the stuff that we have seen, yeah. and, and it shouldn't surprise us because the Bible talks heaps about unity, yes, that's um, right, yeah, and diversity of gifts. And yeah. um, so I've been really encouraged by that. That's and great. Want to see more of that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and not just pastors, but key lay people too that would have mm. every, yeah. you know, when it is. So the Greater West, there, um, Pete Adcock's been helping one church with the building project, helping another church with their. Governance structure, and he'll go to that church for that season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Good. Well, I'm a Carter Pike for this season. Yeah. Transitional consultant, half mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. The other half the time, I'm a dog placement yeah. or home. But yeah. It, it, it's just a very natural, collaborative kind of spirit mm -hmm. across the church. Well, it just reminds me of Paul going mm -hmm. and hanging out at different communities and coming yeah. back. Yeah. Kevin even helps out the Anglicans. I was going to say, in my spare time, I'm in the Anglicans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pushing it too much. We have spent. What about the times on my pinty? Does that count too? Wow. What Yeah. Leaving well. All right. 
Um, just as we wind up, so the next one we're going to do at the beginning of next year is governance. So that's the whole area of how do we form um, groups, particularly lay groups in our churches that are healthy, uh, that are uh, orientated towards spiritual discernment rather than just management. Um, and uh, what's a governance review look like in a church? What's, uh, what are kind of tools we can use to develop um, governing leaders, um, spiritual governance? All those sort of questions are up for grabs next time around. Um, we're going to try and adjust things a little bit next year so that we've got um, people that are doing things on the ground uh, in, in the session after lunch actually presenting some of that stuff so you're seeing what's happening on the ground, you're getting a few reports, um, you're seeing how this actually works in practice on the ground. So um, that's, that's part of our goal for next year. But I think we're looking at four dates to, to work through the rest of the course by the end of next year. Um, that, that's, that's true. All true? Yeah, yeah good. So the dates on next year? Uh, that we're, we're working on those at the moment. It's, part, it's partly my fault. I've, I've got, I take sabbatical leave every seven years and it's up next year, right? So October, November, December is I'm actually taking off next year. Um, so we're trying to move all of the training into the first nine months of the year so that I can need a break by the end. <laughs> we could come to wherever you're at. Yeah, that, well, that, well, actually, I'm not sure you can. The, the, the plan at the moment is for my wife and I, whether we pull this off or not, that remains to be seen, but is to do about... Um, six to eight weeks of walking from north to south right through Tasmania. So top to bottom, right across the wilderness. So Friday, tomorrow evening, um, you might just keep me in your prayers. So Saturday morning at eight o'clock, we start um, eight days of formal training with the University of Tasmania Medical School on um, wilderness and mountain rescue. <laughs> My wife and I, in our 50s, will be with a bunch of 20-year-old Kid, young people who are all mountain guides. Um, so I imagine we'll spend most of our time being the victims. Um, <laughs> being rescued. But we'll see how we go. So that's the plan, anyway. It's just, just to, so you, they say once you hit your 50s, you've got to learn something new every couple of little while. So we're on our learning curve. We're about to make up for a couple of years. All right, let's pray. Let's pray and we'll, we'll wind up. Is that the first date next year? Yeah, they're, they're, the dates are all in process at the moment. We're just mm -hmm. trying to massage them no, to work them out. Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you that uh, while you're an unchanging God, um, we put up with lots of changes. We grow and develop and uh, face realities of life, some painful, some um, encouraging and developmental. We ask that um, as we... Um, journey with others through the processes of transformation, of change, of transition, um, that you would help us to pastor well, to lead well, um, to start things well, and when we come to the leaving point, to leave things well. Um, we pray that um, as uh, those that journey with churches that are going through times of growth and change and also times of struggle, that um, we might be able to tend to the needs of transition carefully and thoughtfully. Um, so that people, as they journey through some of life's big ups and downs, might just be able to do so with faith, uh, with hope, uh, with care and with love for each other. So guide us in our work, we pray. Uh, we pray for your church. Uh, we pray that um, your kingdom may continue to, uh, to move, to shape, to grow, uh, to stretch out in its influence across this nation. And we pray for the small role that we have in um, shaping and encouraging and helping some of those communities of your people um, to be healthy, uh, that you would strengthen us and guide us in this work. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.